Well, I would like to offer my heartfelt congratulations to this remarkable group of students and to their family and friends. I'm truly in awe of your achievements, and I'm honored to have been invited to address you this afternoon. But please understand, I have absolutely no illusions about my role. Not too long ago, I read that 10 years after college graduation, college graduation, virtually no one remembered who spoke at their commencement. So I, I know I certainly don't. So why in the world should you remember who spoke to you at the end of seventh grade? Uh, now, at this point, I assume that you're reasonably wondering why I am up here and whether I've got anything worthwhile to say to you. Let me hasten to assure you, I'm wondering about these things too. As to why I'm up here, I imagine it may be because I won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. What I have learned during these first few years or so as a Nobel laureate is that this award apparently entitles me to pontificate on virtually any subject at any time, regardless of whether I know anything at all about it. Moreover, I have learned that most people will take what I have to say much more seriously than is justified by the content of my remarks. With that caveat, I have indeed been racking my brain, trying to tease out at least a few pearls of wisdom to bestow upon you. Presumably, there should be some elements discernible in my career that might serve as guideposts for you, things worth emulating, or that I might have learned along the way that are worth imparting to you. What I have repeatedly asked myself, have I learned in the almost 60 years since I sat, much as you do today, as a seventh grade student in the Bronx, New York City, that might be worth talking to you about. <clears throat> I realized, of course, that such life lessons are not something one ordinarily thinks much about. One is just too busy living them. I'm reminded of something that my favorite philosopher, the former New York Yankees catcher, Yogi Berra, once said, when he was asked what he thought about when he was trying to get a hit in a clutch situation. Think, he replied, how the heck are you going to think and hit at the same time? So I've been thinking about it lately, and what I decided I want to talk to you about is something I don't hear much about these days. It's the importance and power of experiencing your life's work as a calling. Now, the dictionary defines a calling as a, quote, strong impulse or inclination, a summons to some particular mission usually one of some social value. But let me amplify on that in terms of my own experience. I've been remarkably fortunate to have felt a calling to two careers in medicine, first as a physician, later as a scientist. The notion of a calling is often intertwined with important role models. Almost all successful individuals can readily identify several crucial figures that they encountered early in life or early in their careers who modeled a way of doing things that had immediate and compelling appeal. As a youngster growing up in the Bronx, I had at least four heroes or mo role models. You've heard about a couple of these already. One was the Yankee slugger and center fielder, Mickey Mantle. Another was the humorist, Woody Allen. Another was the author of the James Bond novels, Ian Fleming. And finally, my family physician, who actually made house calls. In the end, it was this latter role model that ultimately captured my attention and my fancy. From about the third grade on, I never had any doubt that I was destined to be a physician, just like him. I loved reading books about doctors, especially novels in which an MD played a central, usually heroic role. So be on the lookout for role models whom you really admire. Throughout junior high school, high school, and college, I actively looked forward to entering medical school. Like you, I was a talented student, and I attended a special public high school in New York City called the Bronx High School of Science. Admission was then as it is today, awarded to those New York City students scoring the highest on a competitive examination. There are no other criteria for admission. Remarkably, I am the eighth Nobel laureate 
to have graduated from this one public high school, a record that places it above all but 12 countries. That's right, I said countries. To me, even at a very young age, becoming a member of the medical profession was something very special, perhaps somewhat akin to entering the clergy, in that one was privy to very special knowledge and also bore unique responsibilities. I thoroughly enjoyed my four years in medical school. Then as a house officer, as a resident and intern, at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. Then as a cardiology fellow at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And then as a young professor of medicine at Duke, where I attended cardiology clinic until about 10 years ago, still actually made general medical ward rounds. These were experiences that I will always treasure. They felt perfectly right for me, an expression of my most deeply felt aspirations and the most natural and productive outlet for my own particular abilities and talents. In other words, I experienced the practice of medicine as a calling. But then along the way, something happened. During the early, early years of my training, I had never really even considered that I might become a scientist. But a two-year experience at the National Institutes of Health in fulfillment of my draft obligation in the late 1960s began to change all that. After a very slow start, during which I displayed absolutely no talent whatsoever at the laboratory bench, I began to show some promise. But it would take another five to seven years before it would become clear to me that my primary mission, the focus of my life's work, would lie in the laboratory rather than at the bedside. So how did I ultimately come to realize that perhaps my truest calling was in scientific research? These are not things one figures out with one's head, but rather with one's heart. For example, I realized that more and more, my thoughts and daydreams at odd times, such as on the drive home from work, were actually on my experiments rather than on patients that I had seen in the clinic. Let me hasten to add, that I'm by no means implying that I believe there is any inherent inconsistency in a career which might combine both medical research and medical practice. Only that for me, this appeared not to be the way. That said, I can tell you that despite my singular focus on fundamental research, for a good many years now, a clinical and physiological perspective always informs and guides my research to this very day. So why do I think the experience of a calling is so important? And how will any of you know if you are launched on your true path one day? The first point is that I don't believe that for any individual, there is necessarily only one possible best choice. As I mentioned, in my own case, I've felt a calling to at least two careers. And I've known many colleagues who have continuously and successfully reinvented themselves in a variety of roles. I would hope that none of you will ever feel hemmed in or confined by choices that you might make early on. Sometimes these can last a lifetime, but sometimes another aspect of yourselves may play a more important role later on. So try to be open to such evolution as your studies and eventually your work evolve. So how will you know if you're responding to a true calling, one that's really right for you? I think that there are various diagnostic tests that you might use. Do you feel a passionate engagement in what you're doing? Does it intensely focus your concentration? Do you experience a sense of timelessness when engaged in your study or work, such that the hours just seem to fly by? Does your work feel, in a sense, like play? Hopefully, in the years ahead, you will ultimately be able to answer an emphatic yes to these questions. I think there are several important elements in this notion of a calling. The first is the simple power of belief in what you're doing and of its importance. This will empower you to achieve, perhaps, more than you would ever imagine possible. The second is the conviction that you were really meant to do this and that the work fully engages the best of your own innate talents and abilities. In this context, President John F. Kennedy in a paraphrase of Aristotle, said the following. 
The ancient Greek definition of happiness is the full use of your powers along lines of excellence. Think about that. The full use of your powers along lines of excellence. So, for you what this means is that in the years ahead, you'll need to be learning about your powers. They will reveal themselves to you, may have already. But just stay attuned to this. Not only your powers, but your proclivities, by which I mean those activities which you really enjoy, which really resonate with you. And don't worry if this doesn't happen right away. As I told you, I had an inclination, as I told you when I was only eight years old. But for most, it will take much longer. If you're unsure, as many of you will be, just try different things. College is a particularly good time for sampling the vast smorgasbord of possible career directions. But whatever direction you eventually choose, make sure that you're truly following your own path, listening to the stirrings of your own heart, and not doing something that you feel someone else wants you to do. A third element of experiencing your life's work as a calling is a sense of enthusiasm for and optimism about what you do. These latter elements are quite infectious. If, for example, you follow an academic path, as I have, they will assure that you'll be an attractive role model for younger colleagues that come to learn from you. If you were, for example, to become a physician, they will certainly be much appreciated by your patients. If you're able to tap into this notion of a calling, you'll be fortunate indeed, for it holds the key to a career characterized by fulfillment, contentment, and a sense of accomplishment. The simple secret is you just have to believe in it. But of course, there's more to life than work and study, as you all know. Maintaining a sense of balance between your studies and eventually your career, on the one hand, and your family life and recreati recre recreational activities and hobbies on the other can provide a real challenge. But such a balance is crucial if you're to lead a full life. My fondest wish for all of you is that, in, that years from now, when you are adults and have found your calling, that you will feel as I have throughout my career, that two of your favorite times of the day are when you leave for work in the morning anticipating the adventures and challenges that lie ahead, and when you return home in the evening, anticipating your time with your family or your leisure pursuits. Now, as I conclude these remarks, I hope that you will not judge them too harshly, but rather will measure them against the yardstick provided by our former president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who is reputed to have said that there are only three important rules for public speaking. Be sincere, be brief, and be seated. <laughs> My heartiest congratulations to you all. Thank you.